Hey everyone, hope it's going well. Um, can you see everything all right? Okay, great. Um, so I'm excited to be here as my first ICLS. Um, my undergraduate researcher co-author Rahul is also here, um, I think without video. So um, really glad to be here. So I'm gonna talk about my paper about a particular programming learning skill and some unexpected um, beliefs and self-beliefs that we found related to this skill. Okay, so the skill that I'm talking about is code tracing. Um, code tracing is mentally simulating the execution of code. And this is a common skill that's emphasized in, in introductory programming courses, uh, particularly at the undergraduate and late high school level. Um, it involves careful tracking of the variables, the control flow, what's happening at one time. Um, and it's it's often emphasized in many programming classrooms through the use of code tracing problems, where you're expected to determine what different variables are after you mentally execute different lines of code. Um, it's also taught through visual uh, tools that sort of model the code tracing process. And there have been many of these tools. I think a recent review found over 40 of these tools. And they often look similar to what software engineers use as a visual debugger. So you can argue that this practice is authentic to at least a software engineering context. So I think sort of matching this importance, uh, hierarchies of programming skills that have been developed for introductory programmers often emphasize code tracing as one of the first skills that students should learn. Um, so I have examples of two different hierarchies, which both place code tracing as either something that naturally develops first or should be taught first in order to produce the best outcomes. And this is based on some, uh, some evidence, um, mostly correlational, some um, causal. So there is some evidence that this might help with later skills. Um, and the problems that uh, computing education researchers often use in order to test these skills are intentionally stripped of any larger context um, so that learners aren't really distracted or influenced by any clues like meaningful variable names. So I just want to point that out because arguably these problems get out of certain skills but aren't necessarily similar to code that students might see in the real world. Okay, so I wanted to investigate the cognitive aspect of how code tracing might actually help students gain other programming skills, in particular, the ability to explain code's purpose in a natural language. Um, so using problems from past studies, I created a uh, think aloud study uh, where students would trace code in order to help them explain the meaning of code in, in English. However, my results had other plans. Uh, so I found a lot of unexpected affective responses to this activity of code tracing. Um, for some learners, tracing wasn't only challenging, which I expected from previous research, but it also seemed to have um, some sort of baggage and was related to some self-beliefs. So my participants um, were intentionally limited to a small amount of prior programming experience. They needed to have no more than two formal college level programming courses, and most had just one. Um, they were mostly undergraduates, some graduate students, eight women, four men, and the majority were from an information major, not a computer science major. Now, something that unexpected uh, that happened is that almost all of these participants had judgments about code tracing. Um, they had some thoughts about it that they wanted to tell us. Um, so I've populated a few of them here. So we changed our analysis approach and we decided to use values coding in order to highlight the um, Oh my goodness, did I just sign out of Google? Can you guys still see my screen? Yes, we can still see your screen. But is it logging into my University of Michigan password? Mm -hmm. It looks like you're typing it in, yes. Yeah. yeah. You don't sing your password, don't worry. <laughs> I think my university is so, I think security is so important that I need to log in every few days. Thanks, University of Michigan. Including right in the middle of your talk, too. In the middle of my talk. <laughs> we really want to make sure that it's you. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, we're back. <laughs> I'd make some kind of crack about technology, but I've seen plenty of people at live presentations have something break right in the middle. <laughs> so it's not Zoom's fault. <laughs> yeah, it's not think, think Zoom is working well. Okay. So I use values coding to highlight these beliefs, values, and attitudes. Um, so we decided to focus on two participants in particular uh, who actually not only had beliefs about code tracing, but actually refused to do some of the code tracing tasks. Um, so one of these participants, as we sort of questioned about what he was thinking the code was doing, um, he sort of transitioned to telling us about how he didn't think this activity was useful. And it led to a pretty detailed conversation about his beliefs. Um, our second participant was a little bit more blunt. Uh, I hated this type of work, let me tell you why. Okay, so to analyze these two um, case studies, we use the Eccles expectancy value model of achievement choice. So this is a complex model with many factors that influence a person's choice to do an activity or participate in an experience. Uh, we decided to focus on these final four boxes, um, mainly the expectation of success on the task, the value for the task, and how self-schemata, goals, self-beliefs can influence expectations and task value. Okay, so for our first um, case study was Charles, an undergraduate information major. And he told us that he did not have a high expectation of success on this problem because he felt like he just couldn't understand all these details. He would overlook small, small details of how code worked, um, and no matter how much he did it, he wasn't going to improve. He also questioned why he should do this activity. Isn't the point of the computer to execute code? Why are you asking me to do it? It didn't seem authentic to anywhere outside of school. And he related these beliefs to his explicit self-belief that I'm not a computer. I can work with the computer, but I'm not a computer. This activity makes me think like a computer, and I'm not into that. For a second case study, uh, we have Luke, a graduate student in information, who actually uses code a lot in his research um, and builds tools to collect participant data, things like that. Um, so he told us that he didn't think he had a high expectancy of success, but sort of in a more conscious way. He said, I just learn stuff to where I need it to achieve my goals. I don't really care about keeping these details in my head. And then as he was looking at these problems, he said, you know, this sort of stuff is just to learn the language. It's just to learn Python. It's like a crossword puzzle that's not fun. Well, how is this connected to anything that I actually care about? And so as he expanded on these self-beliefs, he emphasized that he's not a programmer. Even though he does programming, he is not a programmer. And so his purpose was to do things with code, not to learn about the details of code itself. So what are the takeaways from these case studies? So I think that although we have these learning pathways based on student achievement data um, and their processes, we haven't really considered effective and identity factors in the creation of these learning pathways. And I think it's something that we need to think about, especially as computing education grows beyond just people who want to be future software engineers, but also to people that want to use code in different ways. And maybe we shouldn't require tracing early for all learners. Maybe the cost of this, you know, willingness to not non-willingness to trace this, this rejection of code tracing could disrupt their later learning. Maybe we need alternative pathways. Um, it seems like non-computer science majors might particularly benefit from alternative pathways. And I think my findings suggest that these alternative pathways should focus more on code's purpose rather than the mechanisms of how code work, works. And there might be ways that we can support that with technology or other designs. Um, I think these alternative pathways should be focused on purpose, function, outcomes. They should be contextualized instead of having that context stripped away. And they should be authentic to some sort of real life project or career path, something students can recognize as, as real. Um, so thank you so much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Hey, 
thank you for that talk. Thank you. Okay, as always, as I know we have people going in and out, and so some of you are probably getting sick of me saying this. <laughs> if you have questions, you're welcome to raise your hand and we'll call on you, or you can put questions in the chat window. So I will lead off while people are typing. Um, so I was kind of curious as to how the, this effective piece, this baggage that you relate to, how does this fit into what we heard about in Valentina's talk with mm -hmm with beliefs that students have about their abilities to do things or their cognitive skills? Yeah, I think, I think what was really interesting about these participants is that they did have some level of coding success. You know, they, they were creating programs and, ex and they were continuing to create programs in their future or plan to. However, they didn't place a lot of emphasis on this particular task. So, it seems like belief in the ability to do this task might not necessarily relate to their belief in being able to do things with code. Um, so, and I think that's something that might need to be explored a little bit more. Um, yeah. And then also in that same vein, you, right at the end, you were talking about <clears throat> the alternative pathways and making con it contextualized and authentic. And at least from my perspective, I kind of look at my work and be like, man, I really wish <laughs> I knew how to code. So what do you think would help these students understand the context of why these skills are so important right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that this expectancy value model suggests a few different approaches. You could possibly make the um, expectancy of success higher. Like maybe there's some ways that we could teach code tracing in its current form better so that it's less painful, less cognitively challenging, um, so it's easier to achieve. We could also maybe try to increase the utility by talking about the benefits that it could have. However, I think we have to be careful because like in these students' examples, they were producing code, but not really digging into the details. So the value might not be there as much as we think it is. Um, I think an alternative approach would, and one that I'm exploring in my next project, is to try to make the activity of code tracing itself more connected to the context of what that code is trying to achieve. So instead of trying to trace through code variable by variable, line by line, in a way that's not connected to what the code is doing, we might always use authentic code samples and then provide extra scaffolding to help you see, okay, this whole chunk of code is achieving this goal. This whole chunk of code is achieving another goal. So even the, the process of understanding code at a deeper level could be connected to the outcome in the real world. But I think to get there, we're gonna have to design new tools and new strategies. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's kind of a, just a shift in education too, because when I went through school, you know, this isn't something we had to learn. And then now as an adult in the professional community, it's like, oh, <laughs> I really wish I knew more about this. So we have one comment from Caesar that you can respond to, and then we'll be ready to move on to Caesar's presentation. So he is saying, there are sound theoretical reasons to couch learning activities in interesting, realistic context, as well as your, as well as your empirical results pointing in this direction. Group work would also potentially be useful. Yeah, I think, I mean, it would have been really interesting to see how, you know, if students were more willing to give things a try when someone else is in the room instead of just the experimenters. Um, I think also if, yeah, if you see someone else doing this activity who's in the community of practice that you want to be in, I'm sure that would have um, some, some impact. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of space for computing education examples to focus to be more contextualized. And I think that might be a path forward to bringing programming education to other fields. Like if we're biology majors, chemistry majors, history majors, if we can have those introductory skills be more contextualized, it might be more welcoming to students in those communities. Yeah, and there was an additional comment added to that from, I'm sorry, I'm gonna butcher your name, Gia Theory, who is saying, what, how do we make this a part of classroom culture? Yeah, do you, does this guy three mean the tracing or some other aspect? Yeah, tracing uh, uh -huh. or like just so that not, maybe not tracing in the traditional sense uh, uh -huh. of like going by line, but yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, I think, I think it is something that instructors can have a big impact on. Um, in an earlier study, I did some observations of classrooms to see how much the instructors use code tracing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it wasn't consistent. Um, I think, you know, if you incorporate that appro approach to understanding code more consistently, students might be more likely to do it. Um, right. Yeah, but I think in my work, I found that it was inconsistently applied. So even sure. with traditional code tracing, I think that it could be modeled a little bit better. Yeah, and also I think I liked your idea of like making maybe like like the increasing the granularity so that it's going to be more manageable for novices, yeah. like looking at chunks instead of like lines or like single right. variables or something. Yeah. yeah, I think it's fascinating how right now the code tracing kind of models the way a compiler executes. Exactly. Code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it more how humans execute code. Or yeah. Think code. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. All right, thank you for that talk. Give you another round of applause.